from this Sunday morning comes from the first chapter of the book of, of uh, Jeremiah. One of the prophets that we don't hear quite as much about as some of the others, but he did have a lot to say. And in this particular passage, he is speaking to the people of his time and his place. Any who have an ear to hear, let them hear the word of our Lord. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in my womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. And then I said, Ah, Lord God, truly I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am only a boy, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. And then the Lord put his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appointed you over all the nations and all the kingdoms, to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. Our second scripture lesson comes from the fourth chapter of the book of Luke. Then began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote me this proverb. Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do hear also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah. When the heaven was shut up for three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land, yet Elijah was sent to the none of them, except to the widow of Zephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which the town had been built, so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. May God add his blessing to this the reading of his holy word. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Before I form you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you, says the Lord. I appointed you a prophet. Do not say, I am only a boy, God says to Jeremiah. Do not say, I am only a secretary. Do not say, I am only a truck driver. Do not say that I have no value. Do not say, I have nothing to offer. Because God is calling you. Each of you. Yep. Even you. And if it's true that God's calling you, then what will you do? In the scriptures, in the New Testament, in the letter to the church at Ephesus and Corinth, God, there are an outline of a few roles that come to mind when we talk about the work in the life of the church. Some are apostles and some are prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers. Uh, in 1 Corinthians, uh, they add some miracle workers, some healers, and some helpers. You know, in some churches we conduct, and we've talked about doing this for some of our newer members, we conduct spiritual inventories. So we go through a long list of things we see we're good at, 
things that come naturally to us and then uh, realize that we are prophets or realize that we are apostles or helpers or healers or teachers. All of this to say, God is calling you, each of us, to do the work and truthfully, throughout the scriptures, we read what are known as the call stories. Jeremiah is not alone. Moses, David, Paul, all of them called by God and all of them eager and willing, right? No. All of them. I can't do it. I'm only a boy. I'm short on words. I was a persecutor of Christians. How can it be me? None of them felt ready. None of them felt equipped. None of them felt adequate for the challenge that was before them. <coughs> Why would the Bible tell the stories this way? Wouldn't it seem a bit more like them to say yes, and then he stood up and he went and he followed the Lord, right? Why would he tell the stories this way? Perhaps they know how human we are, how resistant or reluctant we can be, or how we can lack strength and confidence, and faith enough, trust enough to go and do the work, to come and participate, to teach the children, to lead them outside. God is calling you. You know, scholarship reads some of these stories and says that it is the evidence of the truth of the text, in that they're not airbrushed, photoshopped, or touched up, right? They are told in all their imperfection, in all their honest, raw humanness, and to give us something to talk about, to relate to, a sense of inadequacy, a sense of fear about what's next, how God might be calling us, and how we might be rejecting the call. It's okay. Because in the course of time, we are in a very chosen lot. Among the chosen people called for the work that is before them. Jeremiah, called to be a prophet, someone to speak out on God's behalf. You know, oftentimes in some uh, areas of Christian teaching, we are taught that the prophets predicted Jesus' coming, predicted the future, and then Jesus fulfilled that. But the longer you study and the more we realize that the prophets rose up in their own time and place to speak to the powers that be, the kingdoms that rose, and the oppressors that were at work and at play. The prophets rose up on behalf of the king to look at the people and look at the communities and say, no, the gap between the rich and the poor is not supposed to widen. We are supposed to be there for those who are in need. The God's covenant is upon us, and we are called to do the work. The role of prophets was to warn against the evils of the age. And now is no different. It was dangerous work then, and it's dangerous work now. Not popular for sure. And you know, pastors in training are taught to comfort the afflicted, those who are suffering, but to afflict the comfortable, right? are taught that if we're simply playing back everything y'all want to hear, then we are not doing our job. We are called to be challenged, called to be outraged, called to wonder, is it true? 
Catholic priest from some time ago, but um, he was due to retire, and as many of you know, sometimes, oftentimes, in retirement, pastors and preachers are appointed back into the life of the church. So retirement comes just at a certain age, and it's a bunch of paperwork, but preachers are put back into the church to continue to serve. Well, this particular priest had been speaking out on behalf of victims of sexual abuse at the hands of their own. He had been speaking out on gay rights and women's ordination in the Roman Catholic Church. And so when his letter came confirming his retirement, he was told that his services were no longer needed. Because the reality of the situation is it's not just the pews that become uncomfortable with prophets. It is are all the powers that be, not just in society, right, but in the church. And when this church starts to do what the church is supposed to do, rise up <laughs> on behalf of the least of these, somebody's not going to be happy. <laughs> One bishop once preached to us and said, if your church isn't mad at you, you're not doing your job. <laughs> Well, I haven't thought about it, you know. <laughs> Easier said than done, right? And so it is that we realize our part in this. We recognize that God is calling us. Not everybody is called to the role of the prophet. And not every role is quite as dangerous. Some are a little more glamorous. Some are completely behind the scenes. But there are many places for each of us to serve. And now as things begin to transition, we know that there are people who are moving, who are doing jobs. There is a place for you and you and you. Small task work that involve you in the life of the business of the church that helps you to be in real relationship with people. Small groups that might need to rise up to talk about what's happening in the life of the denomination. Opportunities to get to know people better. It is always the concern, right, of the local church when we bring in new people. We want you to be connected to each other. We want you to build deep relationships of love and care and concern. One of the things that was said to me this week is one of the most beautiful things that had happened after last Sunday's announcement is that people started to worry about each other and not themselves. People upset about change and transition, but worried about the other person who's newer here, or who came because there was a female pastor, or for whatever particular reason, people began to worry about each other. And that is exactly how we roll, right? Where this community becomes strong because we are in this together, trying to do the work. Some of us prophets, some of us apostles, people sent out into the world to do the work, some of us teachers, healers, helpers. And so we find our place, knowing that God has a call on each of us. You might remember that from the gospel reading this morning that, you know, only moments before this moment where they're going to hurl Jesus off the cliff. He was in the temple preaching what has been uh, uh, titled his manifesto, the manifesto of his ministry, release for the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty all who are oppressed. And then they're deciding, well, maybe not. <clears throat> Isn't this Joseph's son? What can he know? What good can come out of Nazareth? We're not sure that we only want to meet the needs of the oppressed. We're not sure. What about us? What about the faithful? You know, aren't we going to get our share? And Jesus begins to tell a parable, just as Jesus will. And we all pretend like we understand what it means, and we probably don't. But what he does say 
what he does say in those parables <coughs> is that the only one who was healed was the foreigner, the Syrian. The only one who was met was the one from Zarephath. There's a message there. And Jesus picks up on all that was happening in the Hebrew Bible, all that God was trying to say to God's people. And Jesus comes and embodies that whole thing, and we kind of know where he ends up, don't we? And then he rose, so we could rise, so we could do the work, so we could claim our part. God is calling you, yup, even you. And if it's true that God's calling you, what are you going to do? <laughs> We're going to listen for God. We're going to accept the truth that he's calling each of us. We're going to believe it. That God has a call on each of our lives. We're going to believe it or try. Fake it till you make it, right? Act as if. Just talking about these, these slogans that we employ. Pretend like you believe it until you believe it. Name that call and then get quiet long enough to realize that something is bubbling up inside of you. That you kind of always didn't want to be a teacher or work with children, but you didn't really think that you knew the Bible well enough to teach the kids. It's a good way to learn. <laughs> Maybe you've been really wanting to get a little bit more involved or serve in a particular way, and you know, the church office might be a place where you can work behind the scenes. Whatever you do, do it because it's in you. Bring what's within you up and out of you, the Gospel of Thomas says. Because if you don't, it may kill you. <laughs> The Gospel of Thomas says. And so, find a place to study, pray, or be silent. Find a place to serve with each other. Find a place to study and find a place to serve. All ways that you will come face to face with God's people and encounter the least of them. Believe it. Ask God for direction. Listen for God. And then wait for a feeling. Wait for something to happen. And then wait for something to happen again. Coincidences? I don't think so. God incidences. Because God calls and keeps calling. God calls and keeps calling. Ideas will come. And then they'll resurface. And you'll wonder, well, that's weird. That's God. Moments of inspiration will come, and then it will come again. And use them, because that's God. Tell someone. Call someone. Start a ministry. And know that God is calling you. Answer the call and say yes to God. Never say, I am only a boy. I'm not worthy. I don't have what it takes. Because trust me, God is calling each of you to do the work that we are called to do as a community. Find your place. Find your place. Live it out and thrive. God is calling you.